the feeling of catastrophe is so much louder when you hear it. It's such a kind of intellectually paralyzing topic. It's very difficult to find a way to contribute something that seems useful. You feel some kind of responsibility to be more clear about why you're engaging with this. Why is it important? What's its purpose? You want people to have an emotional journey. That's what music does. It pulls on the heartstrings or it makes you think. And that's the aim of music at the end of the day. It's just how I make sense of the world. It's how I make sense of things that happen in my life, how I make sense of the world that I'm embedded in. The voices there of Karen Power, Sebastian Adams, Ian Wilson, Judith Ring and Jennifer Walsh. Some of the composers you'll get to know in this series, We Only Want the Earth. I'm Jonathan Grimes and as you can hear, I'm a cyclist. I'm also a musician, working with composers and musicians through my day job at the Contemporary Music Centre. But most importantly, I'm a parent. And like many of you, I'm deeply concerned about the climate crisis and my children's future. So in this series, I'm bringing those worlds together and asking how composers are facing up to our changing world and if music can help us confront the crisis. It's a story of sound, of questions and discovery. But for me, it's also a physical journey as I cycle across Ireland to talk with composers about how they're responding to what's happening. Our theme music is Swept Through the Floods by composer Judith Ring, a piece based on floods in Pakistan and performed by violinist Larissa O'Grady. Judith is very environmentally aware and sees her music as a platform for climate activism. There's a lot of responsibility that comes with being able to put yourself out there or bring your work to people. So yeah, I think music has always been and should always be political if you want it to be. It's a powerful platform to voice your opinion. Anyone who has even a small platform should be using it for good. What does climate change and the climate crisis mean to you? It consumes my daily life. It's something that preys on my mind a lot. I do try and live my life with as low a carbon footprint as I can. And a lot of my work is therefore influenced by elements or things that are happening around the world in the environmental crisis. So yeah, it means a huge amount to me in that respect and I think it should mean that much to everybody. It's probably the most important thing that's happening in the world right now and yeah, I think we all need to play our part in doing something about it. Writing music can often feel a little unnecessary or unimportant because of what's happening in the world. Why am I writing music? And what purpose does it have in the grander scheme of things? To me, the environment and what's happening in the climate crisis greatly overshadows what I do in my working life. Do you think that composing helps deal with the issues around that? It helps me on a personal level. I just hope that anyone listening and hearing what the piece is about will take a moment to pause and think about the purpose behind it and also enjoy it as a piece of music. That to me is very important. You want to get a certain message across, but also you don't want people to be left devastated <laughs> from listening to your music. So I want them to enjoy the music, but also understand where it comes from.
Judith Ring's work, Everything is Asleep, as if the universe was a vast mistake, has a powerful dystopian climate message, and it was first performed by the National Symphony Orchestra in 2023. So many people came up to me afterwards saying that they could really see what I was talking about when I explained what the piece was about beforehand, which was essentially about a world without humans and plant life taking over and reclaiming the earth and replenishing itself once humans have stopped interfering. People really seem to engage with that story in a way that I didn't expect. Children especially who heard the piece really like engaged with it and some of them were even very inspired by it <laughs> which is really very sweet. I had a very strong visual representation of what I wanted in my head and then I tried to represent that in sound. So I had all the crawling creepers of plants and stuff and them getting stronger and taking over and then various aspects of buildings and concrete being torn down and you know what that would sound like and so everything was very cinematic almost in my head. We don't sometimes realise the power that a piece can have or that a story behind a piece can have. And I think it's definitely important to put that out there, you know, in a very strong, simple way to get the message across. Single track. Right, crossing a bridge here over a little stream. So I have to lift my bike up, which isn't easy. Just load it down with all this equipment. Anyway, keep 
down. Cycling is my way of connecting to nature. There's something very rewarding about moving through the landscape at a slower pace. You notice a lot more detail about your surroundings. Cycling also helps me think. And as I travel through the laneways on this trip, I think about the role of music in our lives and if sound and music can really help us navigate and respond positively to the climate crisis. Here's composer and saxophonist Nick Roth. Music is the way that you listen to the world. If you hear music in the world, then that is the music. It's the way of listening is what music is. If we can hear music in the world, if you can hear music in water, then it democratizes what music is. It enables everybody to have access to the music that's in the world. We live in a vast, vast, unknowable universe. But yet we're fixated on very daily domestic issues around our lives, our egos, um, things that we value, that in the grand scheme of things probably have very, very little value. That's Stephen Graham. He's a senior lecturer in music at Goldsmiths College, London. And when I think about climate change and when I think about trying to get people engaged with this idea of um, things that may happen in 50 or 100 years, you're left in this conundrum of how to make it meaningful. One of the ways to make it meaningful is through stories and through art, where there's feeling, there's affect, that you can get people imagining different kinds of existences, different experiences. That's really powerful. It's still a very, very tricky thing. I don't think in terms of a climate crisis specifically. What I think about is, is my life's work increasing the amount of life on the planet or is it adding to the death? Is it part of an increasing biodiversity and more types of living beings existing in, in a kind of a coexistence or is it reducing that? But as an artist, we have this ability to plant seeds that can grow in a kind of a wild and untamable fashion at the level of information. I think it has perhaps in some ways a deeper and richer impact on our existence in terms of connecting us to something that is transcendent and something that is beyond the individual and something in a way that's beyond narrative and stories and, and concrete meanings. How you then connect that to climate change and very immediate concrete things, it's a very, very tricky circle to complete. So you do have this tension between the power and the richness of music, yet it's got a very tricky task to actually give information out in a way that a film can give or a book. Stephen Graham on the challenge of making music tell a narrative story. There's ways to touch people with sounds that they remember. To use sound to get people to think about, well, if I still want that sound in my life, or the corn crake or something, how do we look at making sure to protect enough habitats to keep those sounds in our lives? Because when they're all gone, like when all those animal sounds are gone, oh, the world will be such an empty place. That's Natalia Bayless a Leitrim-based composer and sound artist. You're hearing part of her work, Lost for Annie. This piece uses recordings she made before and after a commercial forest near where she lives was cut down. It's something that has had a profound impact on her. Like that part of my piece where it's just 
the person walking on the road. There's no sound of nature. It's lonely. It's empty. It's devoid of richness of life. Having. We are currently located in Drumna Dover. This is the townland. And up until a couple years ago, just over those trees at the end of the driveway, and just beyond these trees and at the back, we were surrounded by Sitka spruce, commercial forestry Sitka spruce. So it was all, all around us. So we're walking out to the end of the driveway um, to have a little look at what it looks like now. When the trees were here, it was lovely. Me and the dog used to walk straight across from our driveway into the forestry every morning and have our coffee. And um, you could just walk along in amidst all these beautiful trees. There used to be lovely hedgerows in amongst the trees. Yeah. That you could walk around, but when they clear felled everything, they clear felled not only the Sitka spruce, they run over the old hedgerows, yeah. they kill the homes of anything that might burrow in there. Like there's yeah. no food in there really, but animals live in there and then come out to eat. We use trees for building, we use trees for toilet paper, we use trees for telephone poles. They're a necessary industry, the forestry industry. These areas are beautiful, aren't they? They're just Gorgeous. rewilding. There's willows, there's oaks, there's birch, there's hazels. It's so rich. What is this gonna happen to this land? It's replanted with sicka spruce. They come in, they take out all the trees that aren't sicka spruce, it all grows up again, depletes the soil, and at the moment they don't know if the soil can withstand a third planting. So after they clear fell after a second round, there's a chance the soil won't regenerate for, who knows, decades, possibly longer. I've spent a lot of time thinking about how art and music and artists and musicians can positively affect things about the climate or, or mm. environment. I think it's a big thing for artists at the moment to try to figure out what can we actually do? How are we actually useful in helping propel change? Mm. I don't have the answer. <laughs> I have a starting point. Uh, so I thought the beauty of all the rewilding in all these areas right around me and the beauty of this field which is just it's just so full of different grasses and life and flowers and moths and butterflies and you know the premise is somehow starting with what can i actually do locally possibly to affect change so i'm trying to start from as local of a point as possible Cycling down a lovely tree-lined avenue. It's giving me a little bit of shelter from the drizzle we have. I'm cycling to Glasnabradham Woods in the hills of Belfast to meet up with composer Robert Coleman. Glasnabradham Woods is a newly planted forest and Robert is leading a sound walk there with the high vocal ensemble and members of the public. And we have arrived. Thanks very much for coming. Uh, I'm Rob by the way, most of you have met me by now. So I'm a composer and sound artist and I've been working away kind of getting to know this side over the eight times. Listening and being present in the natural world is at the heart of his work and for him Creativity and environmental activism go hand in hand. 
Like Natalia Bayliss, Robert Coleman's work starts at the local level, exploring the biodiversity of places through sound. For me, I, like I often say this now about listening, it, there is like an understanding generally that goes with the idea of listening. I think when we think about the difference between hearing and listening, if you hear something, who knows, you're not sure what it might have been, maybe you do, but listening sort of suggests I'm with you, there's sort of maybe some empathy there. Um, and so we're now going to do a little listening exercise ourselves in which you guys can take some little notes, as, as I have done. So I have little cue cards for everyone here, so we'll pass around just a little card. And what we're going to do is we're just going to walk up to the first gateway and um, you guys can just listen out and see what you hear. Um, so of course on site here there's a number of birds, that's like a very obvious one, but you'll hear other things too. So you can think about the man-made sounds. So I've been on site here as well at the crack of dawn throughout all different seasons and listening to what's here. Um, and in my research a lot of what this has sort of been leading me down the route of bird language recently. So a lot of the recordings you will hear definitely involve the birds and the bird species on site. And we'll get into a bit of understanding more about the birds as well as hearing then the whole context of the site here with the tree planters and what it means. That's Robert Coleman's composition, Capturing Sound, performed by Robert with the violinist Larissa O'Grady. Robert is working on a doctorate in composition focused on ecological sound art at Queen's University Belfast. Yeah, well, ecological sound art, it's basically dealing with ecology and making sound art out of that. It has definitely a deep meaning in the sense that it's, I think by its nature, it's sort of quite political as well because of what's happening today in the world and when you're dealing with issues of ecology and the context that's surrounding all that, by nature, I think as an artist, there's different standpoints that you are forced to take almost within that research and getting to know what's happening. Like in some of my projects, I've been sort of dealing with different groups and sort of ways in which you can get them engaged with the soundscape and through that with the world around them and just building an understanding. Then, of course, like artists deal with kind of ideas of metaphor. They can describe some aspect of, who knows, a species that's going extinct or something through just making a piece of musical work. And so this whole world of kind of ecology and the biodiversity is sort of opened up through listening and through our ears, in a sense. Listening in nature is also key to Karen Power's practice as she works to capture the sounds of her changing world and allow audiences to experience them through her compositions. 
I think it's safe to say that I have been listening in the most remote places on our planet and I have been forever changed by them. And part of that change is in hearing the effects of humans and of industry and again, you can't unhear these things. How do you hear those effects? Well, I mean, in so many ways. So in specific places where you've read scientific data or geological data or where you've been told that you're likely to see or to experience this species and you get there and you just hear the same bird calling again and again and again and you know that there's supposed to be countless other species but they're not there. Karen's sound recordings in remote soundscapes began over 10 years ago with a journey to the Arctic. And her fieldwork has brought her to Africa, Asia and more recently Antarctica. This is the Quiet Music Ensemble performing her work Instruments of Ice. I was, let me see, the Arctic was 2013 and then Antarctica was just last year and the ice sounds different. I'm not trying to be a scientist here. When you're field recording, you're taking tiny, tiny snapshots of a moment in time of a place that is forever changing. You're there with people who are looking at data and looking at the changes and you're being told things about the whale food, the kelp that's no longer there. And you're seeing species of penguin, some of whom are thriving, others are dying because of change. So by the nature of placing yourself in these environments, you become part of that story of change. And one thing I will absolutely say has become more important to me is the idea of field recording as preservation. So the recordings that I made in the Arctic in 2013, I return there in 2024 and actually start on the same path. So it will be the same areas, but this time I go much further up into the pack ice. And will I hear the same things? Will the, will the ice... like? You are now perhaps capturing sounds that will eventually not be there anymore. And I think something that I don't have a choice in as an artist, that's not to say that it's going to take over my artistic practice or anything, but I do think that I now have a responsibility to at least acknowledge this. And of course, it's also about respecting the environment that you're in. Do you need to keep some sort of emotional distance when you're recording? When you're there in the space and you have your equipment set up and you're listening, do you have to kind of detach yourself a little bit from all of those thoughts about you maybe recording something that is an act of preservation? Ears aren't emotional. But I don't listen emotionally. I would say where it becomes more difficult is afterwards, the act of composing. So the Antarctica piece for the RT Concert Orchestra, that was a very difficult piece to write.
I'm sheltering underneath an oak tree from the rain looking ahead there are clearer skies and I'm hoping that's it for showers for at least an hour one of the things about traveling by bike is you really have to be open for whatever the weather throws at you you do find you're much more in tune with the landscape and with the outside world and also it forces you to slow down a lot and reflect okay i'm gonna chance going on now the skies do look clearer um, and who knows i may even encounter a bit of sunshine I've made it to County Carlo to meet composer Gráinne Malvi. And much of Gráinne's music is inspired by landscape, nature and natural processes. It's like my meditation. When I'm in that zone, I know nothing can disturb me. It's like I'm outside my body. This is me. This is intrinsic to how I live. This is part of me. I can't not do this. I get very cranky if I'm not composing after a while. It's terrible. Like I'm very hard to live with, I'd say. If I don't write after a while, or if it's a month or something like that, that's no good for me. Hello. Say hello to them. <laughs> hello. That's Vicky and her brood. She should be sitting on them a bit on and off. See, she's yeah. the best of them all. She'll sit on them when they need to be warm. Grania lives in Lachlan Bridge in rural County Carlow, and her interest in climate science connects with the fact that Lachlan Bridge was also the home of John Tyndall, the 19th century physicist who described the greenhouse gas effect. The place that we're in now, I mean, it's habited by lots of trees and things and it's partially where I grew up as well as a kid. So it has great affinity um, for me, the walkways around the village and everything, the riverway, the ecology, the system here, you know, it's quite a vibrant place to grow up because you're really in touch with nature. And then I have quite a lot of trees planted here as well outside and so that gives me a lot of different scope to explore other kind of textures and sounds. I just love the fact that it's in a valley, so you're cocooned really here, and you're exposed to a lot of simple nature, which you might take for granted if you were living in a more urbanized area. And being so rooted in the outdoors and having an affinity with nature, how do you think this shapes your music? Well, it has a bearing in terms of the narrative. For example, if I look at a piece I wrote even 26 years ago called Sextet Uno, and that's the journey of an eel when the river was plentiful with fish. So that's another area where this kind of idea of a different plant life or wildlife, fish life, would be interesting. And the journey. 
back to the Saragasa Sea to spawn and die and the larvae to travel through the sea and come up the rivers and lakes of Ireland and continental Europe and then to live there from 7 to 30 years before they go back again. As a kid, even growing up, you'd witness the plentifulness of fish that used to be there in the riverbeds and now it's much more depleted and it is a crisis there really where a lot of the elvers can't get through to come back. One of the things that I find very interesting is how all of this is translated into sound. Talk to me about that kind of process of the translation between something that's natural occurring and sound. That's a difficult question. I mean, composition is so abstract anyway. I'm not sure maybe whether the listener would actually perceive that if it heard the piece without the title. But where the translation, I suppose, occurs is where you extract something from it. It's like mining. You're actually mining something from a sound. If I could take even an example of another electronic piece that I was working on, where the crackling of the sun, which was recorded by NASA, and extracting a sound from that, an actual pitch, so an audible pitch from sound. That's the kind of thing that I'm trying to do as far as musical impetus and structure and formulating various sections from material. I'm trying to just find something that's tangible to work with. This whole art form is probably the most abstract form of art you can engage with. I don't know whether I would be just trying to flatter myself to think that a message would be gained. The way to reflect a message is via text. Explicitly, you make a point through text. And I think abstractly, you're hoping that maybe people will come up with some ideas but I don't really mind I mean people can come up with subjective ideas if they hear my piece if they gain something from it it's great if they don't that's understandable too From County Carlow, I'm on my way north to County Cavan, first by train and then by bike to meet composer Ian Wilson. Ian Wilson's from Belfast, but he used to live in Cork and his artistic engagement with the climate emergency began with his string quartet Alluvio that was inspired by the flooding in Cork City in 2014. You saw the pictures on the TV of people canoeing down South Mile. And I was working a lot with the Vamber Quartet in those days, and I wanted to write them a new piece. And so the, the idea of writing a piece inspired by the flooding came up. And uh, it was a kind of objective view of the mechanics of flooding. You know, you have 
stuff comes down, stuff rises up, stuff spills over, stuff rises up again into the sky at the end. It was, I suppose, a first foray into something very current, which was on a lot of people's minds, especially in the city. It's certainly inspired by a natural process, which was interesting in a way because it gave rise to working with musical material in different ways than I'd done before. And those things just arise naturally out of following the process. I suppose part of the argument is how do you pass on your concerns as an artist to the wider public? And is that even your job? Is it even possible to make a piece of art that does that? Since then, I've just been trying to work through different processes to decide, well, what's really the most useful approach. After that string quartet, Ian worked on several pieces and tried to connect his music directly to a climate message. But he is not convinced that that approach works. They're a bit didactic. It's a cross between something which is supposed to be musical, educational, entertaining. And I was struggling afterwards with the notion, well, does that work? Is it falling between too many stools? Does it just work as one thing? These are questions that I've been trying to grapple with. And what's the answer? Does it work? <laughs> I'm not sure, actually. It felt at the time that that was the best approach because when you're doing all this research and talking to people, you feel like you want to share the information that you've gleaned. And the best way I felt at the time to do that was to have their voices heard. So, you know, you make the soundtrack, you do the field recordings, but then you think, well, well, is the, is the saxophone just purely incidental here? Is it, is it doing anything? In 2019, he composed a work about food production in Sligo called Ground Out, this time only using very small pieces of text in it. I was trying to imbue the music with some of that sense of struggle that was coming out of the conversations, the struggle between man and nature. So as a musical piece, I suppose it functions on that musical dramatic plane much more than the other pieces which are trying to present actual information. There's much less text actually, and it's informative snippets, and then those are treated very musically. Because they have their own melodic and rhythmic shape, then that would be taken up by the instruments, and it becomes a very musical treatment of mm. a little bit of, of textual information. And so you've got, a, for me, probably much better balance between being a piece of music and being a little bit informative. After Ground Out, Ian Wilson wrote Species Counterpoint. This piece abandoned text altogether, offering a purely musical response. (laughs) 
felt that I should just take what everybody had told me and try and respond to that musically. Not expecting that the audience would really take anything other than the musical drama away, but that was okay at, at that point with that piece. I made a lot of sound recordings in the Muckross National Park and actually had made a, a sound piece out of that. Uh, they were very functional, very useful actually in the context of that species counterpoint because there's a process to that piece going from very natural sounds and then I've processed those sounds as the piece goes on and, and by the end of it we're left with actually only man-made sounds. That was the background also to Species Counterpoint. Then I just, I used that same piece and I, I, I composed the piece for one of the baritone saxophones, Cahill Roach improvises as the other bari. And then when we get to the end of the piece, we're left with just the two bari saxes on their own competing. I know there are a lot of artists who want to get engaged with this subject. And I think it's a matter of personal choice what they want to do with the art, whether the art is just a personal response or do you want to be a bit more evangelistic about it and say, hey, you got to listen to this. I've got lots of interesting things to tell you and get your act together. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> I think that's so actually unlikely as an outcome that I'm not sure that there's a purpose. Having written a few pieces like that, I'm not sure. I've been thinking a lot more after talking to Ian Wilson about this tension between music as a climate messenger and its primary function as a creative art form. Unlike text or visuals, music is far more subtle and impacts us like the air we breathe. We often feel changed by music before we can even verbalise what we're experiencing. Here's Stephen Graham and Jennifer Walsh on the potential power of music in the climate emergency. Music can be really bold in recognising its power. It's not a power that is comparable in some senses to visual media, to language-based media. But really, if we can accept that we're probably not going to reach huge audiences, we're probably not going to reach people in the way that Greta Thunberg might reach them in a very direct, action-based way, our music nevertheless can have a huge cosmic impact. I think that's a place perhaps to start thinking about music's role in the climate emergency. I'm slightly protective of artists because I feel like sometimes funding bodies put a huge amount of pressure on artists. I don't think art has to be about something, you know, and I think particularly with music, what does it even mean to say a piece of music is about something? It's not the same as saying like a film is about something where we can see images of that thing. The way the arts has had to account for itself or even try to protect itself by saying, you know, we're relevant and we talk about politics and there's pressure, you know, on arts organisations to do this sort of work. It's not enough just to make nice music. I think it needs to be really rooted in the context of our current times. That's Robert Coleman. 
we all know the facts really. By this stage, we've all heard biodiversity crisis, climate crisis. And so I think it's a necessity for artists and for really anyone with any sort of means for kind of influencing people in any way, or to reach people in any way, to put their opinions out there and to get people more connected to this and to what's happening. In the next episode of We Only Want the Earth, Nick Roth shares why trees are some of his best friends. For me now, the idea of cutting down any tree at all for any reason is completely insane. I just think it's murder. Why would you do that? And how Jennifer Walsh brings the climate challenge into her work. We know the car crash is happening, but it's happening in such slow motion that we're still in the car. So I feel utterly confused and I try to process some of that emotion through my work.